All right, line Y3, learning task three. We're going to be talking about the DC series motors today. So we've talked about shunt motors, and now we're going to move on to our series motors. And the series motor is going to go and have a different type of winding than what we have uh, for our shunt one. Once again, the purpose of our series winding out of here is going to be to go and create magnetic flux. When current goes through it, that magnetic flux is then going to go and travel over and it's going to create a magnetic field. And that magnetic field is then going to go and repel my armature conductors when they start carrying current. And that's what gives us our rotation. It's just simple motor effect that we have inside of here. Because they're going to be carrying the main value of motor current, if you take a look at this, all of the motor current is going to be traveling through them. They're going to have to be fairly thick and few turns. Few turns and thick wire because they're going to be carrying a lot of amps. Really what we're looking at is we're looking at ampere turns once again, right? How we go and develop flux is going to be off of that formula, amperes times turns. So we have fewer turns, but we have much more flux because we're carrying all of that line current through it. Our connections are going to go and look like this. Now, you'll note that they have got a direction of rotation here that is going to go and be counterclockwise. And they've done everything up until now with everything being in a clockwise sort of rotation. Uh, I'm going to go and just overlay this one with a clockwise. I'm going to reverse this direction on here just so that we maintain consistency with the previous learning tasks, okay? There's nothing wrong with what their connection is over here. It's just that it is different than what we have seen in all of our shunt ones, etc. And uh, we get a lot of unnecessary questions from students that are like, oh, but I don't understand why it's always this or why it's always that when it comes to clockwise or counterclockwise. Uh, these are NEMA standards but they don't apply them uniformly throughout this module over here. And you'll see that inside of the series one, that now they just go everything, you know, uh, running through from the A2 to the A1, rather than having the positive on the A2. So I'm going to go and reverse mine over here because I can, A1 and A2. Uh, when I have got a motor and I have got the A2 to my positive, I'm then going to go and have that clockwise direction of rotation. And if I go and do this, what I've done over here with my uh, A2 and my A1, what I'm going to see is that I'm going to need to go and change these two values that are going to be inside here as well. Like that. And we are going to go and have our line one, which is going to go and be our positive, which is going to go and connect over to my A2, right over there. And then I'm going to go and have my S1, which is this one here, my series, that's going to go over to my S2 over here. This will give me a standard clockwise direction of rotation. What they have in here is not wrong. It just gives us the opposite direction of rotation because they've always described everything in a clockwise. We're going to go to this clockwise that we are going to go and have over here. Taking a look at this now, we can go and follow through the same convention that we had in previous learning tasks where we have got our current traveling through the field from a 2 to a 1. And then it is going to go and travel through my armature. As it travels through my armature, it's going to go and create that flux around the armature conductors, which is then going to repel them out of the field that has been created by these over here. We'll start to go and get rotation. Now we can go and reverse rotation by doing a couple of different things. We can reverse rotation by interchanging the direction of current that we are going to be sending through our armature. Uh, or we can do it by interchanging the direction of current that we are going to be sending through our field. And up top over here, I have got something uh, that you guys should be familiar with. It's going to be your right hand motor rule. We've seen this one before, where we are going to go and use our thumb for the thrust, the first finger for the direction of field, and the center finger for the direction of our current. Remember, we're going to start with the thumb down. We're always going to look at the field and the direction of electron current, because this is going to go and be my armature over here. We'll start with that armature current and with our field, that's this one over here, and we see that if we keep the field pointing in one direction, but if our armature current is going in this direction, that we're going to be fine. Now, if we reverse the field direction, and I can do that by this drawing over here. You guys see that drawing? I just made that drawing this morning because I got sick and tired of trying to explain how to hold your fingers over the air. So I made that drawing over there because now what I can do is I can do this super, super handy thing where I can rotate it. See if I can grab that rotate bar up top there without moving everything around. And I can go and show that if you have got your right hand rotated, I've still got my center finger in the direction 
My armature current is in the same. My armature current is in the same because that's my center finger. But now what I've done is I have reversed my field. So my field has now reversed over to be pointing instead of away from me, but back towards me. And what I see that the net outcome is, is that my thrust, that's the last thing we developed, my thrust is going the opposite direction compared to my original, where I had the thrust going in that direction over there. We see that happening when we go and interchange our direction of our field. If we want to go and interchange our direction of our uh, center finger, uh, which is going to be our armature current, this is going to be the more common way that we would go and change rotation. Right now, I've got my armature current going across in this direction over here right now. If I reverse my armature current, and I would do that just by turning my hand over here, right? Turn a hand like that. Up like that we would then see that now that I have reversed this direction of armature current that my direction of thrust has changed and we can do the same thing off of this one over here same deal reverse our armature current which is going to be that center finger and when I reverse my armature current I see that my thumb changes direction so my thrust changes direction so we see that we can either go and change our armature or we can change our field so they're showing us two different methods inside of here. The first method that they're showing uh, is where they have gone and reversed the field. This is the one that they have gone and endoed right over here. Flip that one around the series field. And it's the same polarities as what they had on their original one. I'm just going to grab all of my drawings off of the original one. Uh, wait. Whoa. I deleted the whole thing. Two seconds. Let's go backspace and try that again. We'll only delete the drawings. Like that, there's their original one. Uh, when we take a look at the original one over here, we see that they were going through from A1 connected to my positive on here. And if I take a look at this one over here, I see that they're maintaining that same A1 to positive as what you have in your drawing that is up above it, A1 to positive. Giving them in uh, the top one here, they had a counterclockwise rotation, but now in this bottom one over here, they're getting a clockwise rotation because they've changed that series field. It's so one method of doing it. The other method of doing it would be to go and endo my armature connections over here. They show that our terminal box, that so they have reversed the armature connections. And when they do so, it is going to go and change the direction. Really, this method two that they're showing over here should be what they start the whole learning task with and they reference everything else to because this method number two over here is the same direction of rotation you know, with, uh, as what we have in all the previous ones. It's unfortunate. It's just a thing that happened during the layout of these modules that was never caught in time and it causes a bit of unnecessary confusion, confusion for students. So, yeah, later on when you're going back and studying through this stuff, you know, uh, before midterms, before they test for this, when you are getting ready for your interprovincial, all of that other stuff, use this one, this figure two here, as your uh, main method. What would happen if I would go and reverse my line connections? Well, if I would go and reverse my line connections, two things are going to go and happen. Let's just start right now by running through. Uh, normally, we had a negative to a positive that was going through from here to here on the previous illustrations. Now what they're doing is they're running the negative and positive through in the opposite direction. What you're really seeing happening is that I'm simultaneously flipping around both my armature and my series field at the exact same time, which is really, if I go back to this one over here where I've got all of my handy dandy little drawings, uh, it is going to go and give me the ability, let me just erase these, to go and flip two things at the same time. And that's really what these two drawings are here for. Why I made the, the second drawing here kind of with the finger gun thing was just to go and show that, look, my direction of field was going away. Now my direction of field is coming towards. Uh, I'm just gonna go right away, away towards. So it's been reversed. I see that my direction of armature current was going in this one here. We're gonna go and say it's going left. Now I see that my direction of armature current is going right. Start to right arm there. And so if I flip both fields at the same time, armature is flipped left to right, my field has gone and flipped from away to toward. What I note stays the same is that my thrust is going to always be in that upward direction. Same as what we had inside of the shunt motor in reversing the line connection does absolutely nothing to my direction of rotation. 
we have to always select either reversing the armature or reversing the field. Of those two, the most common way to reverse it is going to go and once again be reversing the armature if we want to go and change our direction. Okay, don't fool around with the fields because once we get into the compound ones, you would have to be very careful about which fields and how many you go and change. Okay, let's go talk about speed regulation and control. When we were looking at the shunt motor, our shunt motor had, I'm just going to leave us a little bit of room here to go and draw, but our shunt motor had a shunt field that was always connected across my main, and then I had my armature, which was then going to be connected in parallel to that. And I could see that I had two paths for current. I had my shunt field current, and then I had my armature currents that would be traveling through that. Uh, because my armature was independent of my shunt fields, we saw very small variations in speed and load. But in series, what we have now is we are going to go and run all of our armature current through our series field. So it's going to look like this. Here's my armature. I'm not going to put ones and twos on here because it doesn't really matter. We're just looking at magnitudes right now. So rather than muddy the water, we'll just go and take a look. We can say that, look, I could have a small, that would be my blue current through here. If I get a small amount of current through here, I'm going to go and get a small amount of flux that I'm going to go and get through here. Just a little bit of flux that's going to go over for my armature to go and run with. But if I would go to a large amount of current, we'll draw this as a green one here. We'll say that the green over here is going to be a large amount of current. I would therefore have a because it's a large amount of current going through here, I would have a large amount of flux that would go over there. What this does is this gets directly related through this over here. T is equal to K Y I. You should recognize this as one of your uh, motor formulas over here. Torque is going to be equal to my constant of the machine. That's going to be the K. That's how this thing is going to be built. We're going to box that off because that's not changing, right? Once the motor is built, the motor is built. The phi and the I over here are really directly related. When I take a look at phi, phi comes from my current over here, right? The flux comes from my current that is traveling through here. So really what I'm seeing is that my torque is going up on the square of the current because I could you know, just kind of substitute an imaginary I in for that phi because that phi is generated from it, which would mean that a torque would be proportional to my current squared, my I squared. I mean, this also just even makes sense when we take a look at Watt's law. Remember that whole I squared R type of thing that we saw? That was going to be the power, the watts, the torque that we were going to go and get out of something? Uh, it is always going to be off of the square of my current. So what we see is we see this really, really cool graph that we have over here where I am going to go and have torque that is going to go and steeply, steeply increase as I go and draw more current. Now, when am I going to go and draw the maximum amount of current? Well, I'm always going to go and draw the maximum amount of current any time that I have got zero speed on my motor. Let me just go and erase all of this. Over here. And we're going to go back to that uh, previous one where we said the V arm, get this formula before, is equal to my E applied minus my E generator, my counter EMF that I'm going to go and have coming off the motor. Uh, what is my volts to the armature made up of? It's made up of two components. It's made up of the resistance of the armature as well as it's made up of the current that is going through that armature itself. So when I go and start out, what am I going to go and have for counter EMF? Well, I'm going to have nothing because counter EMF is going to be equal to EG is equal to my K phi N, right? And if we have got, or just starting out, my N, my speed is going to be at zero, which would mean that I'm going to have no generated value of voltage. So initially, all of my applied voltage is going to have to get dropped across the armature, right? Uh, let's go and give this a value, 48 minus zero would go and give me that I would have to have 48 across here, which would mean that I'm going to go and have a ridiculously high amount of current going through that armature at any given point as I'm going to go start up. Because I have got such a crazy, crazy amount of current going through here, I'm also going to develop a crazy amount of torque. Now this graph that we have over here looks a little bit odd because it looks like we start out actually with a very low value of torque over here. Remember, this is not where we're starting out when we're starting a motor. We just said that we would be starting with a very, very high 
value of current over there. So actually what happens is when we start the motor, we're going to go and initially close in and it's going to be somewhere way out over here. Boom, we're going to see this huge spike in current as we turn that motor on and it's going to go all the way up. It's way off the page over here, but it's going to go on, which means we're going to have a huge value of torque because torque is going to be associated with that. So my load starts out. We fire that current, we get a massive amount of current, the load starts out, we get a high torque, and then as we get closer and closer up to speed, we will eventually drop down to this rated value of torque at my rated value of speed. It's just a little bit of a difficult sort of thing to go and uh, envision off the graph that they have over here. We do also have a issue with it in that it's not very good at holding speed because it is so incredibly torque dependent that we are going to go and have off of this. So we get another graph that looks something like this, where it's going to go and show that when my speed is at very, very low values, I'm going to go and have load currents that are going to go uh, higher. Now this graph over here does have speed labeled twice, speed and speed. This duplication over here is not a misnomer. All that they're showing us is that they're graphing one versus the other. This is actually the speed curve that they're showing, which is going to be how the speed is going to respond to any sort of given changes in load current. What we're going to see is that when we start this thing up, and usually we're going to be starting this thing up, you know, at a fairly high amount of load. So it's going to start at a low amount of speed. So when we start our motor, it'll actually usually start somewhere way over here where it's going to go and have a low amount. It's going to have a high amount of current initially and it's going to have a low amount of speed and then that that speed is going to go and ramp up towards here it's too wide of a uh, page for us to be able to go and draw that out but we would have to go and draw it out you know quite a ways further like that we start with a large amount of current over here then that large amount of current we're going to be at a very low value of speed but then as we get closer and closer as we start to speed this thing up we're going to be dropping our value of load current if, however, we were to go and change the amount of uh, load that we are going to go and have off of here, our speed can go and change quite dramatically. It's not going to be nearly the same as what we had on our shunt one. Let's go back to another formula that we had earlier. Let me just erase these ones here. Need that inside there. Just move this guy over. Uh, let's go back and just talk about this formula that we looked at before. N is going to be equal to my E applied minus my E armature all over top of my K and my phi. We know what E armature is as well. E armature, I'm just going to move that down there. So we got a bit more room. I shouldn't have drawn it in that corner. Uh, e armature is going to be made up of two components. They're going to go and be the current through the armature, I arm, as well as the resistance of my armature our arm that we're going to go and have there. And so what's going to go and happen is that when I have got any sort of a large amount of current, so let's start with this graph over here. When we start this thing up, we're going to go and have a large amount of current over here, which means that this value is going to be really, really high. I'll switch markers here. It's going to be better. I'm going to have a really large amount of current over here. Well, if I've got a large amount of current over here, that means that this resulting calculation is going to go and be large. And if that resulting calculation is large, the amount of armature drop that I'm going to go and have, this overall top part of my formula is then going to go and be relatively small. I'll just go and draw the top part of my formula is going to be relatively small that I'm going to go and have. The other thing that we're going to go and see is that if I have got a large amount of armature current, that means it's also going through the series field, which would mean that this value over here would be getting quite large as well. So as far as our fraction goes, our denominator, the bottom part, is going to be increasing in size, whereas the top part is going to be decreasing in size, which means that overall the net of that is going to be quite small. We're going to have a low amount of speed. However, as we start to go and drop our value of armature current, so I'm just going to go and erase all of these here, we'll just leave that up there, leave that up there. As I go and drop my armature current, that would mean that the armature value of voltage would be going down, which would mean that my E applied is going to have less taken away from it. So my top part, my numerator of my fraction is going to go up. At the same time, if my armature current is going down, that means the current going through the series field is also going to be going down. And if the current going through the series field is going down, 
That means that my denominator is going down. As soon as I have these type of things happening with the fraction, the overall uh, effect on the fraction is that that main calculation is going to be going up. So we're going to go and see a very, very large increase in speed anytime that we have got this decrease in our armature value of current over here. We see that on this graph over here like that. And this is where our rated load is. Now, when we start out, we're going to be starting, you know, with more than our rated load. It's going to have to start moving this thing, gain that inertia off of it. There's a danger if we enter into this zone over here. And this zone over here is going to be where we would go into runaway once again. If we would somehow lose our load, we are going to go into this armature, current dropping, this decrease in my flux and overall this increase in my speed and it's going to result in these things accelerating into a major major type of uh, runaway. What we want to do is we want to make sure that however we are connecting our series motor to the load should be a physical. Uh, physical, let's get physical. Uh, it's going to be a physical connection that we are going to go and have. Not with belts or anything like that. You want to go and do this with you know proper connections where you're going to either have spline shafts or you're going to have a love joy or you're going to have something that's going to be a direct mechanical connection, gearboxes, anything like that with the load. So yeah, don't use belt drives with these ones here because you can just get these huge speeds, especially if you get a dry a belt that slips and then all of a sudden it goes into runaway. It's just going to burn that belt out right from underneath of that. Because these motors have such incredibly high values of starting torque, they're incredibly useful for getting stuff moving. High, high values of torque are used in a number of our different electrical applications. Uh, mine haulage, huge one. You know, if we're going to go and look at picking up large amounts of rocks, particularly in, you know, some of the large mines where they actually go and have electric powered uh, machines that are digging into them, open pit mines like out in Princeton, things like that, they're going to go and use them for that. Uh, cranes, hoists, and locomotives. If you are unfamiliar with the way that a standard diesel locomotive operates, this is a terribly drawn diesel locomotive over here, uh, but that diesel locomotive is actually a giant generator. It's going to be an engine. That engine is going to go to a gen set. There's the Jenny. And then that gen set is going to go and create DC, which is going to go to individual DC motors that are going to be coupled to these. I mean, if you've got a two kilometer long coal train that you've got to start moving and drag over top of mount passes, you need to have an incredible amount of torque. And because these ones have such a incredible, you know, torque to current value, right? When I am bogged down, I'm pulling a lot of current, I'm going to have an incredible amount of torque. So it helps you to start and uh, run some incredibly heavy, heavy loads that we are going to go and have. Anything that needs to get started, we will sometimes use DC series motors on them as well. There's a lot of stuff where once it's kind of going, another motor can take over and carry on with maintaining that, uh, that direction. But if we've got to start that sucker, oh, we're going to go and do in those cases what's going to be referred to as pony motors. Uh, I'll refer to, once again, it's an application most of you aren't going to go and see, but the giant, gigantic ball mills that are up inside of the Princeton Copper Mine. Those are going to go and be run off of a very large synchronous motor. I think they're about a thousand horse, the, the motor. So it's this massive drum, about 40-ish uh, feet across, not, maybe not, maybe closer to 20, but it's just full of ore and then steel balls. And it rotates like a giant, giant drum and it just rotates, tumbles the ore and the balls get picked up by flanges and dropped onto there. So it's just this continual pulverization. They have got the main motor, which is going to be a synchronous motor driving it, but then they've also got another smaller set of pony motors, DC pony motors, that are going to be used just to get this thing rotating. So they load it up, they then start it up with the pony motors. Once they get it close to rotational speed, the pony motor is going to go and disengage, get taken offline, and then they're going to just run everything from the rest of the motors, the synchronous. All right, that is our series motor. Incredibly useful, torquey little beast. DC shunt motors probably yeah, are going to go and get less and less use because their constant uh, speed, we can replicate that with feedback from a variable frequency drive. But we just can't get the same value of torques as we can out of these, so we will see these around for years to come.